good evening, everybody. It is unbelievable to see so many people here, so thank you very much for coming. But more importantly, thank you for caring about the issue. The environmental concerns that um, we see are not only to do with the chemical use, that is the hydraulic fracturing chemicals, but just as importantly, the drilling chemicals. We're going to talk tonight a little bit about our concerns about water, some of the data that's out on produced water and some of the limits of reverse osmosis. I'm going to touch on air pollution um, because I think that's one of the big sleepers of this issue and is not getting much attention. We'll talk a little bit about salt. There are other issues that I would really love to have the time to deal with, but I don't think in the time we have I can. But things like uh, the carbon footprint of this industry, the methane leaks, the problems with the increase in tremors, which have now closed down wells in both Blackpool and uh, Arkansas in the United States, and of course the alienation of um, agricultural land. And what I'd like to do is frame this talk in the myths. I have three main myths. I'll keep you suspended, so you only see that first one now. Myth number one. The chemical use in CSG is ever so small and it's always so safe. So I'd, I'd like to give some evidence to say that that myth is exactly that. It is a myth and we need to lay it to rest. When we reviewed the industry literature when we started to first put this report together and we were lucky enough to have literature that had been leaked by a whistleblower, so we were seeing a lot of commercial documents that you know, average person never gets to see. And sure enough, what came very apparent was the very large amounts of chemical additives that are used per well. Approximately in one, in one industry document, 18,500 kilograms of chemical additive per well, of which 7,500 or 40%, that's 7.5 tonnes, weren't recovered. They basically stayed in the ground. These were chemicals like surfactants and lubricants and biocides, Many of them had acute or short-term toxicity and chronic long-term toxicity. And what they all had in common was they had little, if any, data on their environmental fate or their ecotoxicology. Basically, no one knew what happened when you released them into the environment. We consolidated lists of the various companies and came up with about 20 to 23 chemicals that seemed to be common to a lot of the companies, and of those, only two had ever been assessed by our national regulator. Still legal to use, but, you know, a terrible situation. The US government talk about 750 chemicals, but Australia's uh, petroleum and, um, sorry, APIA, uh, APIA, Australian Petroleum Production Exploration Association, talks about 46. But sure enough, we found many chemicals that were listed in other companies' EISs that were not on that APIA. I know this is a hard slide and I don't expect you to read it, and I do stress all of this is available in our report and our briefing, and it's a little like Paul said at the beginning, we really want you to take this information and use it. But I just put that up because I want to put to rest this idea that somehow these chemicals are things you would find under your kitchen sink or your bathroom cabinet or in food. Well, sure enough, yes, you can find guar gum and acetic acid, that's two. But I can assure you, you would never find these chemicals that are listed up there under your kitchen sink. And if you did, I'd be really worried about what you were doing. The, the first three are on APIA's list, and even those, you can see, they're, they're respiratory toxicants, they damage the lungs, they're reproductive toxins. The old ethylene glycol, which um, is, is famous for increasing women's risk, women who work in factories with this chemical, their risk of spontaneous abortions. But if you look below that line, there's another five chemicals that are not on APIA's list, but were listed by a range of companies as being used in their activities. Now, a couple of them are carcinogens. There's some that affect the central nervous system. Um, the last two, the brominated biocides, uh, they're chemicals of international importance, 
We do a lot of work with UN and certainly these brominated chemicals and the nonylphenols are both at the international cutting edge of some of the most toxic chemicals, ones that basically the world is coming together saying we've got to get rid of them. I'll just give um, a couple of special note because one of the other things you will often be told is don't worry, they're just such low levels. Even if you were exposed, it, it would be such a low level, it really wouldn't matter. Well, unfortunately, that's another myth that has to go. Because last year, the State University of New York released their risk assessment on um, shale gas and coal, seal, uh, coal seam gas activities. And they identified five chemicals, those ones up there, that are dangerous at levels, at concentrations near or below detection level. What that simply means is these chemicals can do their damage and we can't even test for them. And even if we do do the test, we may not even find them. So just because something is a low level does not mean it is safe. And of course, nobody could talk about chemicals with uh, coal seam gas if we didn't mention BTEX. BTEX is benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene and xylene. And I'm sure you've all heard how the Queensland government wonderfully banned BTEX in fracking fluid. Well, we thought that was wonderful, but the problem was I, I never actually thought it was ever used in fracking fluids in the first place. It was used in drilling fluids, and of course the ban doesn't uh, extend to that. <laughs> but BTEX are a bunch of chemicals that are also found naturally in the coal seam. And they're renowned for being contaminants of oil or air, soil and groundwater. We find them in people's blood. We even find them in children's blood. They have a range of nasty short-term health effects and uh, long-term health effects. And probably the most famous is benzene's link with leukaemia. So, you know, to be honest, when last year Arrow Energy had to admit that five out of their 14 monitoring bores at Dolby were contaminated with BTEX, didn't surprise us at all. Um, what did surprise us when the company tried to dismiss them as extremely low levels, not a problem. So low, not a problem. Unfortunately, benzene was detected six to 15 times the drinking water standard. We don't call that low. Brings me on to myth number two that the CSG represents no threat to Australia's water resources, to our valuable, precious, sweet water. And for that, I think I'll let industry answer them for themselves. And there's that lovely quote from Santos, drawdown of groundwater heads within coal seam gas aquifers is an unavoidable impact. So don't be feel bad, it's just unavoidable. In their EIS, they talked about 7 to 25 metre drawdown in bores near their gas fields in Fairfield and Arcadia by 2028. That is a significant amount of drawdown. But then if we take it a bit further and look at some of the com comments from Chenoir Watermark Coal, they go further. They talk about drill holes or fracturing actually intersecting with the multiple one or multiple aquifers, mixing the water from different levels and altering the chemistry through contamination with air, gas, methane, fracking fluids and natural compounds like BTEX. And so I think we should look a little bit at about produced water because there's a lot of, I think, misinformation going on and there's a lot of farmers, particularly in Queensland, that are being duped into believing that this will be good, that somehow the company's giving them water, that'll be fantastic. I refuse to call it produce water, it is waste water. That's what it is, it's not some wonderful produce. Industry's own estimates is 0.1 to 0.8 megalitres per day of wastewater. In that, five to eight tonnes of salt per megalitre. Now, my maths isn't brilliant, but if you do a little back of envelope, it means that every 10 days, you get a megalitre of water and five tonnes of salt, at the very minimum. Those are you know, significant figures. We know produce water is full of heavy metals and radioactive substances and fracking and drilling fluids. How do we know that? Well, we've been doing some testing out at the Pilliger Forest CSG facility out there, 
and seven months after a spill of produce water, we were picking up, we are still picking up high levels of lead, mercury, chromium, hydrocarbons, and phenols. So what do you do with all of this water? Well, basically you've got three options. You can put it in holding ponds. We're not allowed to call them evaporative ponds anymore. Um, but of course, you've got problems with flooding, with leaks, um, with volatile chemicals gassing off, because you know the water doesn't evaporate only. Uh, the chemicals can go with it as well. And very worrying, if it dries out, you've got hazardous sediment. And certainly, we've picked up thorium in some of the produce water, and thorium in dust is a cause of lung cancer. The other thing you can do, and this is really the, what most governments would love, love the companies to do, is that is to re-inject it back into the aquifer. But, yeah. If, if you go to the company's own presentations to the National Inquiry, um, QGC was quite clear. It is not possible always. It's not possible often. It's quite often never possible to re-inject into an aquifer. And it is nearly impossible to re-inject back into the aquifer from where the water came. I'm, I'm actually quite happy about that because the idea of this wastewater going back into an aquifer really gives me sleepless nights. The third option is you treat release and sell, or out of the kindness of your heart, give it away to farmers. <laughs> Which brings me on to myth number three, that the CSG can provide clean water for farmers. That is not possible. Again, if you go to industry's own documents, if you go to the National Water Commission, if you go to the documents of the reverse osmosis industry, their technologists, they will tell you that they cannot remove many of the chemicals that are used by CSG. They're what are called small or low molecular weight chemicals and they just won't easily be released, you, uh, removed using reverse osmosis. And so some of those chemicals I mentioned earlier, naphthalene, nonophenyl, they're, they're the type of chemicals that reverse osmosis cannot treat. Again, looking at our testing at the Pilliga Forest, we did some testing on treated CSG water. This is water that had gone through the reverse osmosis. And we found high levels of methane, ammonia, boron, and bromine. This was certainly not clean water that was being released into the creek. And also, if it was clean, then why would the Queensland release permits permit a company to pump out 20 megalitres per day for 18 months Water that is contaminated, remember this is treated water, contaminated with 80 chemicals plus radionuclides. There's no requirement for them to do any prior assessment of that cumulative load, um, and that's a real worry, of course, because these are chemicals that are persistent, they're bioaccumulative, that is, they build up in our bodies, and they are toxic. I'll just give you a bit of a sneak preview of that permit. Um, I'm not sure how well you can read it up there, but for the farmers in the room, try to have a look at nitrate. I think it's five down there. Over that 18-month period, the company would be permitted to pump out five and a half thousand tonnes of nitrate into the Condamine River. Unfortunately, that is a permit which has now come and gone. The 18 months is over, and the amount of contaminants that we're talking, 20, uh, 20 tonnes, of, of um, BTEX and a range of other nasties, they have gone, they're in the river and um, gone downstream. Just before I finish on waste, there's a couple of things that I just would like to mention. I am concerned there, there is a Queensland coal seam gas recycled water management plan which came out last year and it worries me tremendously that New South Wales will follow suit. And in this plan, unfortunately, the companies will be able to set their own acceptable levels for those contaminants um, in recycled water, which, yeah, is a bit of a worry. There is real concern over the disposal of the salt. Um, QGC has estimated that they will produce 4.6 million tonnes of salt in southeast Queensland over the life of their wells, about 25 years. Where the hell is that salt going to go? Who's going to deal with the salt? 
If you speak to the companies in this region, they will tell you they're going to send them to license landfill. Well, you know, license landfill in, in your terminology and mine is our rubbish dumps. Yes, they may have a small section which deals with the more hazardous stuff, but it is really our rubbish dumps, our landfills, I shouldn't call them rubbish dumps, our landfills, that's where these tonnage of salt is going to end up. Queensland's also had a brilliant idea about how to deal with all that drilling mud because this is another issue that hasn't had a lot of focus. We've talked a lot about produce water, wastewater, but not the drilling mud. And so currently there's some trials being planned. They'll start very soon. And it will talk about, or the, the process will be, the distribution, land spraying of 20 to 40 tonnes of drilling mud per hectare. Now the company and Queensland government won't be using any Australian guidelines, they're maybe a little bit too tough. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the Canadian Alberta Directive. Now, some of you may have heard about what's happening in Alberta with shale gas. Um, if you haven't, uh, it's good to go home and Google Alberta, and then perhaps that words would uh, worry you as much as they worry me. But in that directive, that will allow lead and chromium at 100 kilograms per hectare. They are persistent contaminants that will never go away. Talk about intergenerational inequity, it, it is just an appalling thought. When you read the document on these mud trials, they talk about the drilling chemicals as if, well, if they're there, then we'll have to do a risk assessment. We haven't got the data to do the risk assessment. That risk assessment will not be public. It will be a commercial and confidence risk assessment. We will not know what is going on to land. And I do stress, this is agricultural land. It's not some waste land that they found. And finally, I just think, oh, sorry, I've got one more slide on, on air toxics. But on the waste issue, I think it's also worth for anybody who's a farmer or does any farming in this region to have a look at the Bamberger study that came out earlier this year. It was a study that looked at the impacts of gas activities and gas drilling, not only on humans, but of animal health. And basically it's talking about animals and livestock as sentinels um, to monitor impacts. And when you read that study and read what happened to many of those um, herds of livestock, not only cows and beef, but um, goats, pigs, chooks, it, it's, it's very, very worrying. So I really do stress it's a good one. You can find it on the net. And so my last thing, I'm just going to talk a little bit about toxic air pollutants because as I said at the beginning, this is the big sleeper. This is the one really nobody is talking about. Yet we know we have companies intentionally venting from their condescent tanks or um, when they do the liquid, uh, liquefying of the gas. We know that the pipes leak, the engineers will admit that and we know many of the wells leak. We know evaporation ponds also um, evaporate volatile chemicals. Flaring, internationally it's known that there's over 250 pollutants associated with flaring, and remember wherever there's a gas field there will be flares. Um, and many of, those many of those are carcinogens. There hasn't been any comprehensive air monitoring in Australia. Certainly in the US there's been some work and that, that really gives us some uh, thoughts about what we should be doing here. But what we have had is farmers in Chinchilla already complaining of noxious air emissions. The response by the company Link was, well, um, we'll provide you with a air conditioner for your home as long as you sign a confidentiality agreement and promise never to speak about it again. <laughs> Fortunately, some of the farmers said, well, I won't repeat what they said, but um, they certainly didn't sign the confidentiality agreements. And their point is, um, a farmer does not live in his lounge room or his kitchen or his bedroom. He lives outside. And when he can't breathe effectively, when he's got, you know, bleeding noses, when he's got sore eyes, or she, oh, I'm being very sexist here, sorry. Um, that, that is a real worry. And, and so the idea that a simple air conditioner is going to solve the real problems of air pollution just isn't on. We already know also from the uh, wellhead safety program that was carried out in 2010, many, many of these wells do leak methane. I think 120 were measured as me, uh, leaking methane. 
Again, the government's response, well, it's not explosive, so it's not a problem, but it obviously is an ongoing source of greenhouse gases to the environment. And certainly the US NOAA study, which came out only a couple of weeks ago, um, that's the National Oceanic Atmospheric uh, Association, a very well-respected scientific organisation, talks about 4% of gas from gas fields going to atmosphere. So with that, I'd just like to thank you very much for listening, and I didn't hear a single snore in the audience, so I'm very pleased. And um, I look forward to the rest of the evening, so thank you.